This is the Pebble Stroop task. The Stroop task is a task where you're supposed to read text that is written in a different ink color. And when the color and the word you're supposed to read are the same, it's easy. And when they differ, it's hard. <coughs> um, there are several versions of the Stroop task we've implemented. And I'll show you a taste of a couple of them, but mainly focus on this one, which is called the color Stroop. And um, here you can see there are uh, sometimes a color written in that color, sometimes a word written in a color, and I have to make responses by a finger press instead of reading. So um, it's interesting that the main um, traditional implementations of the Stroop task have you uh, reading out loud. And these are where you see the strongest effects. Um, if you are supposed to read, um, uh, say, speak out loud the color of the, the thing is written in, um, we are more easily able to read something than we are to be able to judge its color and name the color. So reading is faster than color judgment. And so you see an interference effect, but only when you are color naming. And typically, when you are <coughs> um, when you are reading, the color that it's in has very little or no interference. So that's uh, one thing people don't maybe recognize about the Stroop phenomena uh, or the effect in general is that it's one way, and it only um, and it illustrates this interference in this timeline of processing. Uh, but there's a problem with that when you try to implement it on a computer because uh, unless you want to either do some type of vo voice recognition to code what they're saying, which is error prone, or um, have an experimenter there um, manually coding whether they got everything right, which is tedious, um, you have to have people make a response manually. And so you could do something like a go node go task where you just have them respond to certain um, words or certain colors, but that's not really the Stroop task anymore. And so um, I, try, I tried a few things, and <coughs> initially maybe, uh, initially I came up with this idea. I'm sure I wasn't the first to come up with it, and I probably borrowed it from some other implementations, but this is the initial version of the Pebble Stroop task. And it is more of a demo. It's supposed to compare both um, the word naming and the hue, hue reading um, in a couple different ways. And so you can see here on this screen, at the bottom of the screen, you have sort of the key. You want to um, you want to press a button based on what the color of the either the word is or the color is. And um, at the bottom, the key is color shaded. So this makes uh, this is interesting because it reverses the Stroop effect. Normally, if you were verbalizing it, reading is harder than color naming. So um, I'm sorry, reading is easier than color naming. So you see interference um, for the color uh, reading, but not the hue naming. Um, or is it the other way around? You see, you see interference um, when you're trying to name the hue, but not when you're trying to read. But in this case, if you are um, responding this way, you can sort of easily tell the color match. Um, so the color at the bottom of the screen matches the thing, and you can make that response a lot faster than you can do the reading. And so in this version of the um, Stroop task, you uh, it reverses the order. And um, uh, so that's kind of interesting how uh, it sort of illustrates how the Stroop interference isn't completely immutable and it's dependent on how you're making the responses. Um, but in this task, I had, th I think, three big blocks, at least three big blocks, so some with neutral, some with color naming, and some with shade naming, and some with shade naming without the words and things like that. And it was just sort of to explore the parameters of this. And some people use this but um, uh, at, to demonstrate these effects. But 
when people are using nowadays this when they want to use a stroop task they're often wanting to use it as an individual difference measure so how much interference do you show and can i correlate that with other things like intelligence multitasking abilities personality or whatever and so for that type of task you only need one of the directions really um and so uh you only sort of need the interference direction you don't need to demonstrate the opposite so you can um, cut it down a lot um, to do that <coughs> uh, one there's a famous version of um, implementation that's very standardized called the Stru victoria stroop task and this is written on a piece of paper and it's also a verbal task but i decided to implement a version of this trying to be uh, as close to to the victoria stroop as possible and so now um, i wanted to have the interference be with uh, in the same direction as typically as be with um, when you're trying to name colors rather than reading. So I got rid of the labels at the bottom. So you still have to make these responses. <coughs> and um, and you see one page, and you actually get some interference because of all the colors on the screen at the time. So you get a page of this and a page of word reading, and you get interference costs from this. And this whole task takes like a minute to do. And a lot of people use it as a very short version of the Stroop task. Um, but then I, I decided to implement, uh, I, so I think I renamed this one I showed you earlier to demo because it's really more of a demonstration and not something that could be used because people were still interested in a longer, they were still using this and they were interested in a longer Stroop interference task that they could get better and more reliable data from, I think. And so I implemented a few other versions. One is the number Stroop and this is probably, I think, as an individual difference measure one of the better ones um, because you don't have to worry about color blindness you don't have to worry about um, learning the mapping this arbitrary mapping between colors and fingers um, what you're doing is reading the the le the character which is a number and then seeing how many of those things there are and so i think this if if you are if you are de deciding to just use a stroop has to measure interference. This might be one of the better ones we have, but uh, people don't like the number Stroop because it's not the Stroop. You know, the Stroop interference is one of the most famous phenomena in all of cognitive psychology perception. So um, people like the Stroop because of the Stroop task. So I implemented, based on the number Stroop, this color Stroop. Um, and this is one that's intended to be, have a lot of options to control things with and to be able to um, uh, change number of trials and but it also only has the one direction it only does the interference versus non-interference and congress trial for the um, color shade naming you don't actually ever read the words you don't make responses based on reading the words um, so if we want to look at the arguments there's a lot here and some of these sort of aren't don't no longer um, really work uh, initially when I did this I had s I what I had the system do is um, collect voice responses so you could actually do it verbally and then the experimenter could code it um, yes or no uh, you could use the voice to have a little voice key that detected when the speech started so you could get voice response times and um, then it would save all of the recordings so you could go back over it um, later and record whether it was correct or not. So um, I had that, but uh, when I moved to Pebble 2.0, the library um, that I used for that was really tricky to get working and I, and I dropped it from the system. So I can no longer, Pebble 2.0 can't currently record. So all of the stuff for the voice key and response time and that and stuff, I guess we're supposed, um, voice key threshold and duration and save audio, compress audio and compressor. All of these things were for that version of it, um, which probably is still available in 0 0.13 or 0 0.14. So those are all um, things that are sort of irrelevant. And maybe if I can uh, figure out a way to re-implement recording, we can put it back in someday. Um, <coughs> otherwise, there's a lot of parameters to control the visual look and feel. Um, and some of them are within here, and some of them are within the the translation 
inter interface. Um, by default now, it used to ask you at the beginning, how do you want to do it, and give you the option of using this, but since this doesn't work anymore, the response type to use will be keyboard, and, but um, and so you set it as keyboard. Um, and there is a preset a bunch of trials you can use. So if you set use preset to one, it will use this preset. Everybody gets the same set of trials that are preloaded. But if you want more trials, longer a longer set, you can have it auto generate these things. And by default, it will do a, a round of practice and then a round of um, multiple round two rounds, I think, of testing. The testing will be 28. I think there's 28 trials per block per condition. There are three main conditions, congruent, incongruent, and neutral. So the number of trials per block will be three times this value or three times this value. Um, and then there's a practice round. And one thing you might want to do is make sure people learn it because you could get through the practice round of 24 trials um, and be really terrible. So you can have a threshold. And a reasonable threshold is 75%. So if you can't achieve 75% accuracy on this, then you have to do the practice trials again, and I have a max practice round, so you won't have to do it more than 10 times. If you go through it 10 times, even if you haven't hit this, you will um, do the whole test. Um, of course, you might want to throw people out if they have um, don't get that accuracy in 10 rounds. Um, during the testing trials, there is a, there is a time limit, so by default it's 3,000 milliseconds. Um, you can also uh, um, specify whether they get feedback about whether uh, they were correct or not. Those are some of the parameters we can test. And let's um, uh, let's use let's not use the preset, so we can change these things. And we'll do f uh, four and then eight here. So we can get through one of the rounds pretty quickly and look at the data. All right, so if we look at color stroop, we can run this. And so to start with, this is not exactly the practice, but this is just learning the keyboard mapping. So I'm hitting the, the, the number keys one through four, and it's giving me these things, just so I know what it is. So I can say red, blue, green, yellow. And how I do this is I sort of, red and blue, these are like American flag colors, and then yellow and green are sort of similar colors. So that's how I kind of remember them. Um, and I hit the space bar to begin. So this is a practice, now I have to think, okay, red and blue. Green, so. Yellow, red, you can see if you're trying that some of these can be very difficult. <coughs> Here's one that's going to be incongruent. I have to hit yellow. Uh, blue is in blue, that's congruent. And written in green, that's neutral. Okay, so practice is complete. You'll be tested for real. Remember to answer as quickly and accurately as possible. So I'm not sure what I, accuracy I got, but I must have been 75% or higher because otherwise it would have told me, oh, you need to do more practice. So I'm going to go through this at the beginning of each block again. And we'll see how I do. Um, OK, I have to get back into this. Let's see what happens if I take too long. So around three seconds, I get it too slow. And get judged as incorrect. Um, so there's one block of this, and it should be about 24 trials. I'm guessing we're about halfway through now. And all right, I just fast forwarded a bunch so we don't have to go th sit through it all. So these should be the last few trials of the second block. 
This is sort of a difficult task even without the interference um, because you have to learn this arbitrary mapping. And so it's, ch there's, it's a challenge just to actually remember the, the mapping between the, the colors and the fingers. So you might expect to see sort of a lot of errors overall and maybe an impact on the errors as well as the response time. Oh, too slow. Um, it's also hard to talk while you're doing this. But, um, okay, so I finished. <coughs> and that was participant 66. So we want to look at the data. Um, now, a number of files are created when you do this. Um, for example, this log file keeps track of certain events, so when you started and ended the task, um, just for everybody. And this helps you track down data problems you might have. This will record everybody into a single file, so you don't have to go about merging it. And this will give a summary line for every person. So for example, I guess we'll see this in a little bit, um, I've got two slow errors, random errors, congruence errors, total errors, how long the task took, um, and then RT and accuracy for congruent, incongruent, and neutral trials. So you can see, as ex maybe as expected, congruent was fastest, incongruent are the slowest, and neutral are in the middle. Um, in contrast for the accuracy, the there is no difference between neutral and congruent in accuracy, but in uh, the incongruent were um, were less accurate. So there's two files. One is a summary that's only created at the very end. So this looks at the data afterwards and creates this summary. So if you end early, you never get this. But this gives um, total errors, incongruency errors, random errors, and two slow errors. So these are the ones that I I never hit the button. Um, these are the total errors. Incongruency errors are ones where I made the the response corresponding to the word name instead of the color. And random errors are the other errors that are there. So you can maybe see, if you see a lot of these, that might indicate a lot of interference. And they could be distinct um, dependent measures that you could look at. Um, <coughs> here for the both response time and accuracy of those numbers we just saw, it tells me that there's 16 trials that went into each of these, which is not very many, but we see actually pretty reasonable results even for this small number. And from about 900 to about 1500 to 1100. So you see in this case both a cost and a benefit from, from the match versus neutral. So that's the data you might see. Um, and that'll appear here for um, all of your subjects will be logged into here. And um, then just one last look at the types of parameters you can try. So maybe you want to, maybe you don't like the size of the, the text, you can increase the font size here. Um, again, we could change this. And this is something that you should uh, really think carefully about. Um, I've done this enough that I'm fairly accurate, but it's really hard to get above above 75% unless you really try. And so um, I've considered if I'm if I were to do this, I might want an 85% or a 90% practice threshold and make people practice that five or six times. This could really help get the congruency effects because it means that they're actually making the errors related to the color and the shading rather than just not knowing the answer. Having the practice threshold can, might help um, you know that you have people who know that mapping. And that's important because unlike sort of the typical way Stroop effect is demonstrated, these um, we have to do it with a keyboard. We have to do it with some mapping on the keyboard that's not as natural as just speaking or saying a, a shade of a color. Um, of course, if this were zero, you um, the
the practice threshold were zero, you only ever get one threshold. You only get one practice round. Um, you could play with the response timeout to maybe induce a speed actually trade off. You'd have to do that across trials. So if I were to say this, um, maybe maybe I want a, a thousand um, millisecond timeout, and I would might be call it color stroop fast. Now I can um, select the normal parameter setting or the fast setting, and I could let's see. I could um, add it to a chain here. So I might want to add the color stroop fast. And then, so this one, it tells me I'm doing fast. All right. So this will give me a way, if I save this, of always running that sequence of two tasks. Um, you might want to. Uh, you know, for this, if you're doing it second, you might actually want to go in and uh, remove the practice tr trials altogether or reduce the practice trials a lot if on the second time through. Um, so that is <coughs> the Pebble Color Group task. Um, and it's it gives you a lot of trials, a lot more reliability, and it measures congruent, incongruent, and neutral. And um, an alternative that's very fast that can be done in just a couple minutes is the Victoria Stroop you might want to look at as well. Um, and then also consider the number Stroop. Each of these would probably be reasonable independent variable measures that might differ across people that could correlate with other factors, um, including personality, fatigue, genetics, things like that. And um, yeah, so that is the task. And thank you for watching.